thank you i think you are absolutely in time so uh, yeah, yeah we, we have uh, five minutes left for the next panel discussion to start and meanwhile some housekeeping slides are running i can see dr eu bilias from chicago who has logged in uh, dr oliver ross no hi wonderful great to see you nice to see you hey guys hi uh, dr eu by understand it's around 3:30 am or 4 am in chicago right oh no, it's 5 just past 5 okay. then can it get Yeah. Yeah. I really appreciate, highly appreciate you joining us at this odd hour. And it's what is the time in Manila? Oh, it's um a little over six. Yeah. All right. Wonderful. Wonderful to see people from various time zones in these virtual times, and it is um, actually a, a great feeling. In the last session, we had a speaker from the Pacific Standard Time, so he was at two a.m. in his zone and uh, other speaker from hong kong who was like uh, similar to manila time so yeah, yeah. uh okay, I, i believe the moderators must be joining so i'll just okay i can see dr jagdishwar gaur so we have actually crossed 2000 registrations for this meeting and it is going on uh, pretty well hi dr gold good evening thank yeah, hello good evening nice to see you in a wonderful background of robot all over yeah and nice uh, thank you for uh, inviting me and uh, thank you for sharing the whole session and so we have actually crossed 2000 registrations yeah, no, for this meeting excellent sir good morning it is going on uh, pretty well hi dr gold good evening Hello. Please mute one or nice to see you in a wonderful background of robot all over. Please mute the sound audio. uh dr mangla are you here yeah we can see hi 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 dr ayu hi how are you it's ice tea it looks different but it's ice tea <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't mind if in if it's something else it's okay 5 am in the morning yeah i can't have anything else <laughs> so uh, i would like to now uh, invite dr jagdishwar gaur and dr vivek mangla to take the panel forward dr jagdishwar gaur is a leading surgical oncologist and a leading robotic surgeon in hyderabad uh, at and the head of surgical oncology at yashoda hospital dr vivek mangla is a dynamic gi onco surgeon specializing in hpb surgery and director at max hospitals in patpalganj and vishali in delhi So over to both of you. Please introduce your panelists and take it forward. Thank you.
Yeah, uh, uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, we have eminent faculty uh, from abroad as well as from India. Dr. Uh, Vivek Mangala, Dr. Ayub Ilyas, Dr. Vivek Bindal will be there around, and Dr. Edward Oliveros, and Dr. Shivinder Singh. Welcome to you all, uh, honorable uh, panelists. What I'll be doing is I'll be starting off the presentation. Um, basically, uh, it's a very huge topic, and uh, we'll try to cover it in short. Uh, in, the, in the time given. In between, um, Dr. Vivek will chip in uh, during the bariatric session. I hope my screen uh, is seen and I'm audible. Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, yes. Screen could go to full screen. Yeah, I'll do that. So, yeah. So robotic surgery has been a new technique altogether and uh, lots of ifs and buts. Um, basically, it's about the cost and the learning curve. Uh, but I feel uh, the data will take a lot of time before that uh, one should start doing it. The exact data of uh, benefit is still is still on the roll. It's not yet still proved much. And basically, um, but uh, um, I'm, I'm I would like to I would like to ask Dr. Ayub and Dr. Edward, where do you think uh, where do you think the robotic surgery is not being taken off in many places, especially in the developing countries? Is it because of uh, cost, lack of training, or what's in what's in your opinion, Dr. Uh, Dr. Um, Ayub Elias? We'll have a panel discussion like session and with your own experience, your in country and your experience and how to take it, take the robotic program forward. I think, I think we are making progress even in developing countries because you look at the, uh, I'm not, I'm not talking about intuitive. You, you look at the intuitive map, it is pretty. And uh, like you mentioned, I think the two important factors are number one is the cost. The capital cost is a huge burden for healthcare system. And when you translate the dollar value in the Indian rupees, that's a huge, uh, a huge capital investment. And two is having a structured training program, wherein uh, because uh, when you start, you know, when I started my robotic program in a place, I call it a completely robotic virgin territory. And uh, so all of the surgeons, the community was on uh, watching me carefully. What are the, my outcomes are? So. When you introduce a new technology to a new group of surgeons who are not really trained fully enough, then the outcomes need to be perfect. So you're looking at a novice community and expecting a perfect outcome. So it's a combination of both. So we need to have a good structured training program. You should have uh, enthusiasm from a, uh, from a community of practicing surgeons. Not It's, it's different for... Uh, a fellow or a resident to get trained in robotic surgery, come and start practicing, compared to a practicing surgeon, now go get trained in robotics, when where he's very comfortable laparoscopic or open surgery, now he goes and gets trained in robotics and comes back. So uh, it's a combination of both, like you mentioned. Is it covered under insurance under your, in your country, the robotic? Uh, it's, you, you, it's, it's interesting. You know, if you look at the robotic surgery collaboration on the Facebook group, you know, last few days I saw a few of these hernia cases are being rejected by insurance. Here, um, and I mean, I always feel uh, uh, the larger agencies have left us a little bit in the limbo because we don't really have a code, a CPT code, to code for robotic procedure. We still get paid for only laparoscopic procedure. And a lot of the parts of robotic, robotics is not just about the instrument, because there's a lot of accessories. Like for instance, I do <coughs> mesenteric angiogram. You give ICG, check your anastomosis. I put ureteric stents and I put uh, ICG in it and do ureterograms. And you don't get uh, reimbursed for that. So I mean, the reason is the reimbursement, it translates into financial viability for the organization. If I use a uh, ureteric catheter, I use ICG, those uh, technology translates into benefits for patients. But to continue to sustain the, uh, uh, the technique and the process, 
you need to be reimbursed in a, in a place. Unfortunately, healthcare is a business at this point. I mean, as much as we don't want it, it is what we've been thrust into. So uh, it is a problem here that Rabari said, he, although about 10, 15% of the cases, we were about 5%, I think we are moving towards 10 and beyond 10% of the cases into robotics, but we still have, don't have the codes for it. We still have a lot of insurances who reject, let's say, uh, if you do a Nissan, a robotic Nissan, it gets rejected. So what they do is they do minimally invasive Nissan fund application. For my colorectal procedures, I've never been rejected for it. So there are instances where we have issues with insurance coverage. But otherwise, uh, for most part, we get paid for a laparoscopic procedure. But Edward, do you do you agree to this point? Then we can go to the next slide. Or you have differ anything? Oh, no. In yes, your country? I come from a developing country, uh, Philippines. And when we had the first robot in 10 years ago, we couldn't believe it. Um, it costs around two and a half million US dollars. And we were thinking how much would we have to, how much would a patient have to spend for this kind of a surgery? And cost is really a big issue up till now. Um, I think that's the only factor that limits uh, the surgeons from um, doing this surgery for their patient. Yeah, we all want to do robotics. Every MIS surgeon wants to do robotics. But um, when you factor in the cost for the patient, they will choose laparoscopic surgery. And that's where I do most of my surgeries, even if I want to do robotics. Uh, another thing, it's covered by insurance in the United States, but not in the Philippines. So every patient shells out a big sum of money just for this surgery. Um, with regards to the training, um, there's a lot of training around Asia, um, especially around Korea. So it's easy to get training. Too many surgeons want to train, but there are not too many patients who can have the surgery. Yeah, I, I, I brought out this point because many people object to use of robo because of the cost. The cost is the same. I think many, many of us, many, many surgeons would have taken it out. Doctor, are you, where do you think the actual advantages are there, especially in your field, colorectal field? Uh, from, for me, I feel it's tremor-free, uh, good magnification, a stable 3D and the full control of camera, especially suturing, uh, these are the advantages I feel. What's your opinion about this? I mean, we, uh, we, we look at it, uh, are we talking about advantages to the, to the robotic instrument yes. and to the procedure and to the patient? So let's put it that way. You yeah. know, if you look at it from, uh, from a surgical perspective, for low pelvic surgeries, it's the best platform we have around. So if you want a minimally invasive platform, laparoscopic platform is not optimal because there's a lot of limitations with doing low pelvic surgery, it's a difficult redo operation, redo pelvis, or uh, challenging situations where BMI 50, 55, 60, and you're in the low pelvis in a male, it is going to be difficult with laparoscopic. And open low pelvic surgery is not the answer. We all know the number of uh, uh, San Marcos retractors will have to use to get to the low pelvis in a narrow male pelvis, you know? And uh, so uh, open surgery is, when you change a minimally invasive uh, uh, low pelvic procedure into open procedure, it doesn't make it easier. It only makes it more challenging as well because it comes up with newer uh, issues. But robotics make these platform, it, it, it doesn't make it easier, but it makes it doable. So we could stay on a minimally invasive platform. And uh, from low pelvic surgery point of view, if you look at it, apart from keeping it minimally invasive, Identification of structure. So for me, like identifying autonomic nerves, you know, uh, yes, we could see autonomic nerves a lot better in a laparoscopic surgery in a good visual system in, a, in an optimal patient, but in an obese patient and trying to maintain planes a lot more easier with that. And then the adjuncts available with it, like, uh, like identifying ureter. And, uh, and now that translates into outcome. For instance, uh, the length of stay for a uh, left cancer is changing from seven to 10 days now to five to seven days. So minimally invasive colectomies, my left colectomies, you know, I, I, can, I can say for myself is uh, we, I looked at my data for the last four years and it was like from five days to change to over three days in the last 18 months. And I looked at the last eight months data is 1.75 days on an average. 
and most of uh, uh, my right hemicollective means I do completely intercorporeal, and I can send them home in in day one. Return of bowel function. Return of bowel function on day zero. You see regularly. You do intercorporeal suturing for the anastomosis. Yeah, I mean, uh, now again, uh, we will have to talk about the right and left. I do yeah, completely I intercorporeal, staple, the right anastomosis, and I love it. Because keeping the organs in its place and doing an anastomosis is different from eviscerating the organ and doing an anastomosis. That puts a stretch on all of the nerves, all of your mesentery, and that limits your, the amount of uh, mesocolic resection you do. The outcomes is different, particularly when you are resecting a uh, transverse colon, a proximal transverse colon, a mid transverse colon, human laparoscopically, you're trying to get it out in an obese person and then doing extra corporal anastomosis. Very different than you can do it inside. And then you can take the particles closer to the aorta. And uh, so uh, those are all the advantages you see uh, in, in a right hemicolectomy. Left hemicolectomy, I still do, if it is a, a unconventional left hemicolectomy, let's say if I'm doing a splenic flexion mass, and I do still do it for corporeal stapled anastomosis. But if I do a low pelvic anastomosis, I now do end to end anastomosis. But I want to mention about nice procedure, natural intercorporeal, uh, natural artifacts, intercorporeal anastomosis extraction by Eric Haas. Some of them are really doing a large number of these procedures here. And a lot of surgeons are getting into it. I probably will get into it pretty soon. And that will limit, you know, one of the, once you move from, you know, in open telectomy, if you go into a, uh, a colorectal forum with uh, open colectomy procedure, patients talk about patients, self circle group. They talk about you have to have a colectomy, then you have to have a hernia repair following your colectomy. That doesn't happen here anymore because we are keeping our uh, extraction uh, incision smaller. And now, if you are able to do even natural orifice extraction, you only have an eight millimeter ports. You know, imagine getting a sigmoid out or a low, uh, uh, low rectal tumor out, uh, provided with, 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 I mean, we still have to. Uh, debate on oncological uh, safety of uh, uh, transanal extractions. And imagine uh, you getting such an operation with just four, eight ports. Yeah, we'll go into the details further, colorectal down. Dr. Vivek, there are one or two points, uh, Dr. Vivek Mangla, like uh, in bariatric. I think you will cover that. You'll be covering, I'll skip these two slides, especially these are for Dr. Edwards. You'll be covering them, isn't yes. it? The revision surgery. So I will skip those. Because we don't have a surgical oncologist here, I think your specialized both the specializations are different. Should we cover esophagus or should we skip it? Dr. Vivek. Uh, we could discuss, I could answer some of the esophagus things. Not an issue. So you will be there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So do you do you do do you prefer robotic or laparoscopy uh, in uh, in esophagus? Uh, in esophagus, we are doing that subjectively. Basically, we are not using the robot at all. But we had kept Dr. Shivender on the panel just because we thought that he's he does a lot of robotic esophagus work. Yeah. Probably for some reason he's not there. I'm not being able to reach him as well. So I think uh, probably uh, what I could reflect from our VATS experiences when we are doing a supracranial dissection, when we're doing going out onto the other side, probably what will, in terms of reducing the tremors, in terms of uh, a longish procedure, in terms of lymph neck, probably it is going to be surgeon fatigue. It probably would be helpful if the uh, robotic procedure could be done instead of a VATS procedure. At the same time, lots of these procedures are completed uh, with uh, thoracoscopy alone. And uh, there also it gives a very good uh, exposure and uh, with a reasonable amount of experience, yeah. you can really do whatever the robot can do as well. We were doing lots of VATS, but Robo, when Robo came, we just stopped doing VATS. We just we do only Robo for esophagus. Robo for esophagus and low colorectal, our GI team only does Robo. Basically, the advantage is the stability of the instruments, especially playing over the portion membrane trachea, uh, handling the RLN nerve, the vagus nerve, the nodal dissection, we found it is better. We have published our data also, 162 robotic with the opposite RLN, uh, in our, uh, uh, our study of 162 cases of robotic esophagectomy. We found quite quite good lymph nodal retrieval and, and opposite nodal dissection aorta pulmonary window quite good. But uh, I think we should not, uh, because the, both the panelists are different field, uh, I don't want to stress more on this. So I found esophagus, yes, definitely. I have, I have, I, I can vouch for robotic procedure because of the stability of instruments, simple play of the instruments, atraumatic and beautiful 3D vision. We can go around and play, play around all the structures. So, so I think I, uh, I'll skip the GE junction, I think, no, because uh, we should involve Dr. Edward more. 
So I think you can uh, take over, Doctor. Yeah, I think I'll essentially be involved in Doctor. Nice. Uh, we are engaging our own thing. Yeah. yeah please, uh, I'll, I'll end my this thing. Then I'll come back to the colorectal session for Doctor Ayush. You, you sure. can take up the bariatric one. Yeah. Can you see my slides? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Please go ahead. Yeah. Just a minute. I'm just trying to go full screen on this. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I have a few disclosures. Essentially, I'm a laparoscopic surgeon. I do a lot of upper GI hepatobiliary pancreas and colorectal laparoscopically. So probably I'm out of league kind of, and probably that's why Vivek has put me here as well to give a counterbalancing view to all the robotic surgeons there. I have no experience with bariatric surgery and. Uh, my entire robotic surgery experience is a short duration observership at uh, City of Hope in US. Uh, coming to uh, basically, I thought I'll start off with advantages of robotic surgery over laparoscopic surgery. You know, be patient, then we could start with Dr. Oliver Ross as to uh, uh, like obviously you will always have a obese patient. And what are the particular advantages in uh, when you are operating on a bari uh, bariatric surgery rather than any any other upper GI surgery, especially in an obese patient? Is that for me, Dr. Magda? Yeah, that's for you. Okay, okay. Advantages um, of the robot robotic surgery over laparoscopic surgery. Yeah, uh, I'm a laparoscopic surgeon primarily, and when I started robotic surgery more than five years ago, the 3D vision was uh, was exceptional. It was um, high tech, and you could see every part of the cavities um, with ease. And tight spaces were they were so easy to dissect with the robot. Um, that's what I saw the first advantages were, but lately when we have 4K um, uh, 3D just with laparoscopic um, ordinary machines, uh, it's no longer an advantage. So I think the, the best advantage in bariatrics right now for with robotics is the suturing. Um, suturing is so much easier if it's your first time compared to doing it laparoscopically. It's so much easier with robotics. Um, for me, that's the biggest advantage now. It's no longer the vision, the 3D vision. You can get at 4K with laparoscopic machines. So I think the biggest advantage now is um, suturing in tight spaces. And uh, Dr. Ayub, would you like to say something about colorectal surgery and obese patients? Does, it, does the robot really, apart from providing stability of the instrument, does it really make, uh, say for example, a low anterior resection, does it make it easier in terms of the dissection, operating time? What does the literature say about uh, obese patients, robotic and colorectal surgery compared to lab. Again, uh, like it uh, treats it minimally invasive, decreases uh, conversion to open operation, makes anatomy a lot more legible in 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 someone with a BMI of more than fifty. And uh, yes, if you are, uh, you know, most of the low colorectal anastomosis across the world, we we end up uh, very very comfortable with the anterior anastomosis. Yes. But if you want to do a hands-on anastomosis without the use of stapler, and again, it is a doable, it is, people are moving towards it, but again, it's in the early stage. Uh, so for low pelvic surgeries, uh, also, I, I wanted to point out one of the factors of robotic surgery, robotic colorectal is not a single quadrant operation. You can't just go into pelvis and finish up the operation because you've got to swing it around and go to the left lower quadrant and left upper quadrant and sometimes into your transverse colon to get the colon down. So compared to an SI where it was a lot more challenging, the XI makes it a lot more difficult and more versatile platform. Still, there's a lot more room to improvement because there is still, there are areas where we could do a lot more potentially better work technically from a robotic uh, uh, biomechanic point of view. But yes, it does make it a lot more easier and I pretty much do a 99% uh, robotic practice. And uh, about five years ago, uh, I, I met somebody for, uh, called Craig Johnson, and he was talking to me, and then he said, hey, are you by do 98, 99% of these cases robotically only? And I couldn't believe him because his conversion rate is, he says, pretty much zero. But now I see myself. So, uh, and then that translates into better outcome. If you keep it in MIS platform, able to complete the procedure, and able to get a good oncological outcome. Initially, like with everything else, there were non inferiority studies. There were questions about oncological outcomes, lymph node harvest, you know, uh, a circumferential margin, particularly if you're doing an APR, uh, uh, cylindrical APR. Those are all possible. Keeping it MIS and still able to do it. Uh, and good circumferential margin. So those are like 
with every evolving technologies and uh, like I'm sure if uh, you've uh, been doing the laparoscopic era, initially there was hesitation getting in the laparoscopic era. There were questions about the validity of, uh, of endpoints. And then now it was uh, validated later. Now similarly, we are going through that part. And I think we have already discussed about esophageal surgery and uh, I'll move on to the next slide. So uh, Dr. Oliver Ross, any particular step in a sleeve gastrectomy besides suturing where you think uh, the robot would uh, make uh, the task easier or maybe help improve outcomes in uh, sleeve gastrectomy? Actually, when it's a sleeve gastrectomy, I prefer laparoscopic. It's so much easier for me, but um, there are some surgeons who just staple or they, and they include suturing. So my sleeves right now, um, before I just staple, now I include suturing. So if you use a robot uh, together um, with stapling and suturing, uh, it's better. But if it's just pure stapling, uh, I would prefer laparoscopy um, in general. Yeah. But then again, if a patient is willing to have it done robotic, I will offer the robot, of course. And uh, just going to some uh, bit about the literature and uh, what I found was that uh, recently published uh, systematic review and meta-analysis of 16 uh, studies, none of the, which was a randomized trial, it showed that the outcomes between lap and robotic sleeve gastrectomy were essentially comparable. And uh, with a slightly higher mean operating time, length of hospital stay and cost, obviously in the robotic group. And probably that's what kind of uh, we would expect as well in a relatively straightforward procedure like a laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy where the only suturing you would be doing would be like covering the staple line with a seromuscular stitch, which would also be run continuously. So probably that's not where the robot has the niche advantage as has already been highlighted by Dr. Aliveras as well. Uh, another study, 108 patients, uh, a retrospective review, no significant difference in operating time. Just trying to say that probably they could uh, come around doing the same operating time with the robot, although it's expected, it, it would have been expected to take longer and uh, hospital stay or complications. However, they also showed that there was a slightly higher weight loss at six months with a robotic uh, sleeve gastrectomy. Coming to uh, one anastomosis ga gastric bypass or a Roux and Y gastric bypass, where probably one or multiple anastomoses need to be done, some which could be done hand soon. So any particular step again, where the robot would help uh, make the procedure simpler? Dr. Oliver Ross. Okay. Yeah, um, actually, um, th there was a latest paper that came out from the United States in 2018 comparing robotic sleeve and the bypass, which I think you, you flashed one of the slides. No, there's no difference, um, robotic or laparoscopic. No, uh, actually, in the robotic, it takes a little bit more time, something like 186 minutes, or and the laparoscopic was 120-something uh, minutes. Well, time is not really the, the factor here. It's safety. Um, safety is more important than the time. But then again, when it comes to the gastric bypass, there's more suturing there. There's two anastomoses. So for me, the robot would be more advantageous for the gastric bypass because of the suturing. Uh, I primarily don't um, staple when it's um, robotic. I, I, I hand sew. Um, when it's laparoscopic, I mean, yeah, there, that's where I staple the anastomosis. But for the robot, I think the biggest advantage in ga gastric bypass would be the suturing. There's not too much of a tight space there. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Livas, another point which I would like to uh, ask you about is since you do both lab and robotic as well, especially in obese patients, when you do bariatric surgery, do you see any difference in uh, the skin wound healing or for that matter, uh, the post-operative port site pain in the robotic versus the laparoscopic arm? Because some people say that uh, there's a lot less traction on the robotic ports and the way they are placed, they are more ergonomical because uh, less post-operative pain. Do you have the, a similar experience on that? Um, oh, well. The um, incisions, uh, the port incisions for the robotic are a little bit bigger. Uh, okay. I, I have a lot more five millimeter in the laparoscopy. Um, actually, three out of the five um, incisions are, three, are five millimeter. Um, with the robot, they're all bigger. So yes, you can have probably more, uh, slightly more infections in the wound, but, but very slight only. When it comes to pain, I think they're all the same. It just okay. depends how you manage it medically. So probably that advantage of robot overlap in obese patients in terms of port side pain is probably a little overstated. Then, yeah. So uh, again, going to some literature review on uh, since the aim of the panel discussion was to see if it really improves outcomes. Uh, so just putting some slides on that. Uh, these, uh, there is a study uh, in obesity surgery 2020 this year, 222 surgeries, 114 robotic, 108 lab. And they found that with the robotic uh, surgery, the duration of surgery was slightly shorter. There was a lower C-reactive protein levels at days one and two. 
and kind of 8% kind of 7.6% reduction lower overall clinically significant complication rates and uh, with the robotic surgery and then they said that overall low post operative hemoglobin was low in the post operative day 2 but then pre operative hemoglobin was similar but that is very a bit difficult to explain so essentially trying to say that when there is anastomosis involved when there is suturing involved probably the robot would end up reducing the operating time it would probably help in precision suturing and probably that's where it would have a lot of benefit another surgery uh, another study where people have compared uh, laparoscopic gruen by gastric bypass a circular stapled anastomosis a hand sewn anastomosis and a linear stapled anastomosis for a rygb and uh, obviously needless to say the uh, operating time for the uh, hand sewn lap uh, rygb is going to be much longer than the stapled and then obviously for the robotic as well however there were other advantages of robotic approach with a uh, lower stricture rate a shorter hospital stay and a lower readmission as well and when comparing uh, uh, overall outcomes they said and they, the paper hasn't really described what they mean by other overall outcomes they said that there wasn't much difference between the two but to my mind a lower stricture rate which is a long term uh, implication of surgery a shorter hospital stay and a readmission rate which is a, sh a good parameter of uh, short term outcomes of a procedure robot probably does uh, has some advantages over the laparoscopic surgery uh coming again uh, sorry dr ayu for uh, not putting anything to you but i have been told that you don't do any bariatric uh, and uh, no, so yeah sorry i don't understand yeah yeah so that's why all these questions are for dr oliveros <laughs> and, uh, dr oliveros when it comes down to revision bariatric surgery uh, do you uh, do you have any preference of lap versus robotic or do you think robot has advantages because literature as i am going to show in the next slide the literature actually prefers a lot uh, weighs a lot in favor of laparoscopic revision surgery rather than a robotic surgery what is your experience in this all right a uh, good question on this is but can i answer um can i just comment on your previous slides regarding the clinical outcomes yeah okay. i could take it back yeah yeah I, i'd like just to make a few comments uh, when it comes to timing whether it's longer with robotics or shorter because it in your presentation it said there it's shorter with robotics it will depend on surgeon experience if you're just beginning it's really longer 4 hours 6 hours to do robotic bar uh, bariatric surgery when you're a beginner but when you're an expert it's so much faster and it's actually probably easier to do robotics and laparoscopic if you're an expert if you've done like 100 or more um robotic bariatric surgery cases but when it comes to clinical outcomes like um infection bleeding there's no statistical significance it's already proven the out clinical outcomes are more or less the same it's just the operative time and for me operative time is not a big it's not a big thing safety is more important yeah. um even if you do it 2 hours uh, but your safety wasn't as good uh, it's not worth it um i'd rather take my time and and do it safely now when it comes to revision bariatrics i'm sorry to yeah. say i don't I have any has made really. a very valid point that at the end of the day a 15 minute or a 10 minute even if it's statistically significant doesn't mean much if it compromises safety but here i think what we are trying to say is similar or lower complication rate with a lesser operating time that is probably if we are able to achieve that combination probably that would be ideal and That's just an true. extension of this question dr oliveros with an expert person like you doing both laparoscopic and robotic what is your uh, take on your operating time in terms of lap and robotic it takes the same time you take longer with the robot or lesser with the robot okay <laughs> dr mangna i'm an expert in laparoscopy robotics not that much okay okay uh, okay uh, <laughs> we just let that be then yeah. um, for now i can say uh, the robotics takes more time <laughs> yeah well so, it's not because of the so doctor yeah. the next question of revision bariatric surgery there okay i have no experience in revision in in, in robotics um I, i would if i have my revision is more on laparoscopy okay. so I, i'm pretty yeah. sure yeah if so it's robotic is, revision it's yeah. it will um favorable kind of the literature kind of also supports what you are saying as well uh it says that robotic surgery was associated not just longer operative time but also a higher length of stay higher icu admission rate higher bleeding and higher leak rates as well and when it came down to revision of uh, rubai gastric bypass the aggregate leak and bleeding were higher with robotic surgery although the transfusion tended to be higher with laparoscopy and in sleeve gastrectomy the reoperation readmission intervention sepsis organ space infection transfusion was higher with robotic surgery probably that's where probably the experience world over is probably a little less and probably as it grows their uh, robotic surgery may probably come closer to laparoscopy but with the ability to do a multi dimensional surgery like you can see in one quadrant another quadrant with the lab probably in revision bariatric surgery there could be some benefits of lab over the robotic surgery 
thank you very much. We can now go back to Dr. Uh, God's uh, slides. Uh, Dr. Vivek Bindal, do you want to add anything there? Uh, Vivek Bindal has joined us. Yeah, uh, no, uh, just on you know, the, on the revision pediatric surgery, you want to add something? Yeah, I'm an expert. These were discussions and enjoying them. So uh, I think there is there is a lot of literature available on both the sides, and this particular paper which you quoted last was actually reviewed by me for surgery for obesity and related diseases and rejected on some kind of uh, you know uh, data points. So what typically happens is when you have a registry, a large registry like MBS equip, and you analyze a very specific outcome based on uh, uh, based on techniques, a lot of variables are not taken into account and that leads to uh, bias. So when you see direct comparative studies between robotic and laparoscopy in Roux-en-Y gastric bypass or duodenal switch, there is a definite advantage of robotics which is seen especially in terms of low stricture rate, low leak rate and low ulcer rate. And uh, this has been proven by meta-analysis of these trials which are well-conducted randomized trials or a non-randomized case control study. But when you uh, when you look at a, a big database like MBS Equip, a lot of uh, factors come into play. And uh, robotic surgery, uh, more than half of the cases have been done by surgeons who were actually in the learning curve in robotics in, in this large database. So uh, in bariatrics, there is definitely an advantage of robots for suturing, for doing a hands-on anastomosis, for uh, suturing in super obese patients for getting away with torque in super obese patients, dissection in revisional cases and we have published many of these papers with our own outcomes. So I would like to you know uh, disagree there that robot does not have a lot of application in its current form. But yes, no, that's, that's not what we were trying to say. We just talked about literature about revision surgery. The rest of the things probably in Rubai gastric bypass, I think it does have its advantages. Sleeve, we didn't find much uh, support in the literature, which could really be meaningful. And uh, revision was where probably the literature tends to say that probably a uh, lab could be a shade better than that. We are not disagreeing on the role of robot in uh, bariatric surgery. Absolutely. Yeah. Can, I, can I join in? Yeah. 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 No? Dr. God. Yeah, I think the Hyderabad is having a lot of flood situation here. So the current is a little unstable. Uh, sorry for that break. Yeah, Dr. Ayub. Uh -huh. You know, yeah. uh, uh, just a picture Are you the, question, the right colon and the LAR, which procedure would you prefer and why? Uh, laparoscopic or robotic? Uh, I mean, uh, 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 just to go back on revisional bariatric surgery, it's more complicated. You know, my point on that is even you do a revisional low pelvic surgery. Uh, uh, like uh, it was mentioned, it all matters a lot more on the individual experience of the person. And the data lags behind the reality as well. It, because it, it literally takes a few years for what we see uh, in our operating room, in our clinical settings to translate into data. And when you take a large database, the non-homogeneity of the data does skew the results towards the other side. So, uh, even with the uh, uh, redo bariatrics, if you look at the data from experts, they're going to be a lot different compared to uh, what we see on the lipid. Now, between uh, the question was between right and left colectomies, and uh, I am a little biased. My uh, I'm, I do a fully robotic practice, and I love my uh, one of my favorite operations in intercorporeal right. I mean, uh, uh, because it translates into, not that I just love it, and um, it, it's very gratifying for a surgeon to not, to not touch a colon at all. And the only time I tell my patient, the only time I touch your colon is when the part of the colon is completely uh, transected and you're all re most and when I'm retrieving the specimen. So from a surgeon's perspective, uh, for a high BMI patient, and uh, when you are doing a right hemicolectomy, particularly hepatic flexure, when you do a right extended right or a subtoral, these are pretty oncologically very safe procedures, and probably you get a better mesocolic resection with that. And uh, in an obese patient, 
I mean, anytime you avoid a midline incision in anyone for that matter, even if it's a eight millimeter port or 12 millimeter port, you're trying to avoid a midline incision as much as possible, I would do that. And you can go around, switch your extraction side to left upper quadrant. Most of the time I take it out through a left upper quadrant, three millimeter, three centimeter incision for my extraction stuff. And, the, and I have not seen a hernia at the left upper quadrant, just at the subcostal margin from an extract. Or you can go down to the supra, please, they can put a three centimeter incision and take out the mat. And this translates into technically into a lot of them are doing non narcotic collectomies, meaning totally no narcotic at all in the entire surgery and post operative treatment. And those who take narcotics as well, I'll end up giving them maybe, uh, initially I was giving them 20 uh, 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 narco or Tylenol 3, what we have here is hydrocodone with acetaminophen. And then I changed over to 10, and now I'll give six tablets. And most of them take half a tablet or one tablet the night they get home. The length of stay, there are people moving towards same day discharge, like within two. And I have had multiple less than 24 hour discharge after right hand collecting. So all these translates into less hospital stay, like uh, Dr. Ulala Jagdish was pointed out from uh, one of the questions uh, on the chat box. I saw that it translates into definitely decreased length of stay. That translates into more uh, uh, less expensive from the hospital side or for the healthcare system and a lot of benefits for the patient. And uh, if you look at now translate uh, turnover to a lot of one of the intriguing part of, uh, you know, when you get a tumor, let's say in a splenic flexor or in the distal transverse colon, it's a little bit of an, I, I put it down as a non conventional collectomy. It makes it a little tedious or a little challenging for to do them laparoscopically, even open. Robotically doing an intercarpal and anastomosis, you get better margins, you're a lot more comfortable doing them as well. So MIS, keeping it MIS, keeping it intercorporeal, that is a lot of advantage with the robot. And uh, uh, now moving on towards the LAR, the pelvic anatomy is really good. Uh, the urogenital funks, dysfunction after uh, after low uh, anterior section or low pelvic surgery is a lot better. Oncological outcomes are a lot better. And circumferential margins are better. And uh, that translates into better outcomes as well. And perfusion assessment, which is even available in laparoscopic surgeries uh, these days, makes translates into lower lethal. I mean, you do an end-to-end -end anastomosis, if you're worried about a particular area, laparoscopically, let's say, and identifying the posterior margin of a low anastomosis is kind of challenging sometimes. If you want to uh, evaluate it robotically, it's a lot more easier to evaluate. And I wouldn't say at this point, one of the things I don't want to say is, oh, robotic is more safe. I don't want to say that if laparoscopic is a safe surgery as well, but the same thing, robot makes it a lot more doable, a lot more keeps it in MIS platform, that translates into better outcomes. And better uh, cost-wise, it makes a lot more sense as well. And the last point I would want to make is the progress we are making uh, in, the, in the continuum is about transanal. I do a lot of transanal. For instance, if you have a, a complex polyp in the midwest, in particular, which you can get through transanal, through a conventional transanal uh, uh, surgery. At the robotic platform, now we do robotic transanal, like we used to do all along transanal endoscopic microsurgery and TAMIS. Monorobo TAMIS makes it a lot more interesting. You can get better outcomes. What do you use uh, transanal? What, what, what robo you use? Oh, no, XI, XI. And, uh, sorry? Yeah. XI with the or single port. Yeah, single port, and uh, you have the sleeve which is now available at 4.5 centimeter, 5.5, and I think the other one is a 9 centimeter, depending on where you want to go. Like, you, these are, it's, it's very interesting, change is completely paradigm of it. Imagine you have a mid for let's say, uh, a complex, uh, uh, an early T1, or uh, you have a complex poly, which needs to come out. In a conventional opener laparoscopic setup, I like to do a low LAR, I mean ultra low LAR, and then give a diverting nucleostomy. And imagine that in a, in a, in a 93 year old, like someone I had recently. You put a robo platform, you just go in, do a local excision, and come out. Outcomes are pretty good. And even in a, 
you know, in a complete response, uh, a complete clinical response after neoadjuvant radiation for a, for a, a mid-retinal tumor or a low retinal tumor, you can remove a film thickness uh, excision transcranially using the robot. And now uh, a lot of data shows uh, between wait and watching and local excision versus uh, doing you know, conventional uh, oncological resections. Uh, there's a lot of uh, interest towards uh, uh, local excision after complete clinical response. So the transcranial platforms is a huge innovation now with a lot more uptake from the surgeons. And uh, right now I keep it only for my early T1s in, in, in selected patients and for complex benign uh, uh, polyp, the precancerous polyp. So avoiding uh, ultra low LAR with a diverting leukoleostomy to someone who gets a procedure, goes home the same day, or I keep them overnight just to be because uh, if I do a full thickness excision and I repair them, I, keep, uh, I give them about 24 hours of IV antibiotics, but potentially I could send them home the same day. And the, the, the most interesting part from nearly all of my patients are, it, the endotracheal tube hurts them for the procedure than the one I did transanally. They don't even need a single Tylenol tablet, which is like, a, uh, what is it, cosine or, or acetaminophen whatever you call it, it's, it's Tylenol here, I get used to it so much. So they don't even need acetaminophen. So uh, it's completely a painless procedure, a bit, with, with very good margin. They have a carcinoid in the mid -weapon. and uh, you, which you can't get it through, through a transanal. Yes, TM is possible. And I was doing TM all along till I moved over to Robotam. So Robotam is, it's, it's it's technically a little challenging procedure, but once you get in, because rectum is a smaller space and you have three instruments and a six inch uh, suture material to suture in, it's not, uh, uh, it's not a walk in the park, but it is a doable. So uh, there's a lot of developments with the robots. So, ro when you talk about robots, there are phases. We'll have to, uh, we will have to understand the evolution of robots and the data lag behind the evolution of the robot. So we can speak on to the data which is lagging behind the evolution of the robot and the reality and hold back on the robot. So uh, there's a lot of people have different kind of interests, but we'll have to understand, look at uh, the data point in, in, in relation to the reality of robotic I think uh, we, are, we are just finishing the time, Dr. Vivek Bindal. Can I make a comment? We have five minutes, so you can have a closing comment from. Yeah, Dr. Edward, you had a comment. Yeah, um, with regards to Dr. Mangla's slide on the revision bariatric surgery or any revision robotic surgery, um, the, the experts who have done a lot, they will tell you the surgeon fatigue is less. Uh, at the end of the day, they prefer to do it robotics because um, they're less tired and the dissection is better. Is, is that true, Dr. Bindal? Yeah, uh, so Bindal, Vivek laparoscopic mm -hmm. surgeon, uh, there is hardly any fatigue for bariatric procedures. It's they are pretty quick now, after your learning curve is over. So that's why, and most of the bariatric surgeons are very good laparoscopic surgeons. So that is where they do not feel the need of a robo really. And sometimes you know, uh, especially in the early learning curve, they would find robotic surgery to be more cumbersome as compared to their standard laparoscopic procedures. So they just give it, uh, you know, they just stop doing it after initial few procedures that it is more cumbersome. But yes, uh, after you are, if you are convinced by the technology, if you do around 20, 30 cases, then you realize that uh, in my experience, I think the stability of the platform makes a lot of difference. The stability of the camera, we hardly change or clean the camera in entire robotic case. While in laparoscopy, we'll have to take it out, clean it, uh, put it back every 10, 15 minutes. The, uh, uh, the endorist and the ability to suture with the left hand again makes a lot of difference, especially in suturing. Ergonomic comfort is something which uh, advanced laparoscopic surgeons or trained surgeons are able to, you know, train themselves that they are happy even after laparoscopy. I'm pretty sure Dr. Oliver Ross will be happy doing any kind of bariatric procedure laparoscopic without any fatigue. So. Uh -huh. Dr. Ayub, uh, being a uh, very good robotic surgeon, what are the future? What do you think the future should be in the robotic arena? 
and what are the newer developments that are happening in your country regarding the robotic uh, robotic surgery you know, like uh, if you see augmented reality being inculcated into that or miniaturized robots are coming up or you know i i i tell i tell others that this is an exciting time to be a surgeon and even among our panel groups i was saying initially it's an exciting time to be a surgeon because of the developments in in uh, the body surgery particularly in colorectal surgery now we are able to get an lar through four uh, eight millimeter ports and can get that specimen extracted through natural artifice that that's a perfect and uh, imagine a combo surgery when you're using uh, when you're working with a gynecology team or a hepatobiliary team or your urological team and then you're doing a complex combination procedures these are all possible so advantage is the more the players the better for us and um, the more the robots in the market is better for us because uh, monopoly of uh, a company is not uh, technically good but having said that it is has done a very good job in uh, addressing a lot of issues and keeping but again cost is an issue the cost the difference between india and developing countries and the uh, united states is the cost of the robot is put down to a capital cost of running a hospital it is not translated into patients and uh, it is not allowed even by insurance companies that's why we are still being reimbursed for a laparoscopic procedure not a robotic procedure is still considered in my eyes so uh, the more the players in the market it will drive down the cost and particularly not just the cost of the robot the disposable instrument cost and you know for instance now in theory by increase the number of the uh, usage of each individual instrument with covid situation wants to reduce the cost and they all everybody wants to sustain themselves in the market as much as possible and appear competitive and uh, and appropriate in their in, in their commercial behavior as well and uh, so more the people of the from from a surgeon's perspective i think that there are a few areas where we need to work on is one apart from individually getting better i think we should have envision a system for our trainees how do we include robotic surgery in our training setup and how do we sit in you know i always tell them the best place to sit is in the in the director's box as we surgeon should sit up on in hospital committees and ensure that uh, we protect you know if you want to chance if you want to protect your body surgery you uh, unless you make it uh, uh, easily affordable for our patients you won't be able because that's a bottleneck issue in in, in developing countries so moving towards putting a robot as a capital investment rather than as a patient uh, uh, translating into patient expenses would be a great uh, opportunity for us because it translates a lot into market share because if a hospital has a robot they'll share into market value as well yeah thank you so much dr ayub dr edward and uh, dr vivek square dr vivek dr vivek for participating in the session and because, even uh, working together <laughs> you were we vex square uh, at the same hospital till about 4 months back no vivek <laughs> double dhamaka ho gaya aaj <laughs> so thank you so much and thank you iags thank you. for giving the opportunity yeah, i nice think this is thank you thank you thank you to all the panelists and moderators it was a wonderful discussion thank you dr mangla and dr yeah. god for making it so nice and uh, thank you dr oliver ross dr ayub uh, and you know uh all the panelists for taking out time